The sport of lure coursing has been around for decades, and so has the equipment that made it possible. Enjoy Lure Coursing has a long history in the sport and a strong future under new ownership. Stay tuned to learn more. Greyhound Nation is next. This is Greyhound Nation, episode 42, recorded February 7th, 2024. The Enjoy Lure Coursing Story. Greyhound Nation is a podcast for Greyhound enthusiasts produced by Greyhound Enthusiasts. To learn more about our show and its hosts, visit our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Greyhound Nation podcast. I'm Michael Burns and now here's your host, John Parker. Welcome back, Greyhound lovers. We're glad to have you uh, back with us again for another episode. We've previously had an episode on the sport of lure coursing, which is an amateur sport for greyhounds and other sighthounds. And tonight we're going to tell you about the nuts and bolts of the sport, the equipment that makes it run. Uh, Our guests uh, for this episode are Trina Bianchi, whose late husband Tom founded uh, the oldest lure coursing equipment company in the U.S., Enjoy Lure Coursing Equipment. And then uh, the new uh, owners of the company, uh, Eddie and Selma Komenick from Tennessee. Katrina comes to us from uh, near Burlington, uh, Vermont, where she and Tom made their home. Uh, Trina, welcome. Thank you for having us. Tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about how you and Tom got I- involved in um, side hounds and in lure coursing. Okay. In order for me to explain how Enjoy began, I sort of need to tell you a little bit about Tom as an individual and a bit about his background. Tom's DNA included a gene that guided him to always pursue excellence in whatever he was doing, whether it was plowing snow in the yard, doing accounting, tying flies, whatever he did, he was going to master it and he was going to do it perfectly. Less than perfect wasn't acceptable with the ultimate goal to do it with joy in his heart or in joy. That being said, he grew up in a small town in central Vermont, and he grew up wanting to be a gunsmith. As a matter of fact, made himself a hunting rifle when he was still in high school that was an exquisite piece of work. His parents had other ideas, off to Bentley College, studied finance, and became an accountant. So his hands, which wanted to do work with wood, were relegated to using a calculator. It wasn't long after we were married that Tom started dabbling in wood, looking for something that would afford him some income. Um, What happened was I have some beautiful lamps in my house, some beautiful bookcases, but he was still doing accounting. In 1977, we were at a dog show in Bromont, Quebec. We had corgis at the time, and there happened to be a lure coursing demonstration on Saturday night with Salukis. I'm a big believer in karma. We were camping beside a woman and her daughter who lived outside of Montreal who happened to have Salukis and had a litter of Saluki puppies. Tom fell in love with lure coursing. He loved watching the hounds run. He had grown up hunting over beagles, so he appreciated a hound doing what the hound was bred to do. He fell in love with one of the Saluki puppies, a little grizzled bitch who wasn't available. Maybe that was a good thing. We came home, we went back up to another dog show that was near this woman's house. And she was at the show and she invited us over for dinner and introduced Tommy not only to Canadian Sherry, but also to a little male cream Saluki puppy. My husband was normally very quick to make a decision and fly with it. And for whatever reason, he was vacillating on this. So I told her to bring the puppy to the show the next day. I handed her a check and I brought the puppy to the truck when it was time to go home. That was our first Saluki. His name was Lando and we didn't have equipment, but we took him to Sherbrooke, Quebec to teach him how to see if he would course. And he did. I had him at a trial in outside of Montreal <clears throat> in 78 and he was running great and he fell 
mid-course. Popped up, came in on the lower. When I went to get him and put the slip lead on, I tripped and fell on him, and he gave the scream that only a sight hound can give. I'm sure Afghans do the same thing. And I knew he was hurt. So I looked, and sure enough, he had a hole out of his groin in the rear leg. What had happened is when he fell in the midfield, he fell on top of a pulley. And the equipment at that point in time, the pulleys were open metal spinning hubs. So that when he fell on it, that was like a buzz saw into his leg. Tommy was not at the trial because at that time he was working um, in Philadelphia and coming home every other weekend. And fortunately, um, it did not hit anything like an artery in his leg. It could have been death knell for the dog. It wasn't. We flushed it out. I flushed out the wound and ultimately it healed. But what it did do, it was life changing for Tommy because he immediately said the equipment isn't safe. It needs to be safe and I can build a better mousetrap. And he set to work making the standard corner pulley kind of like this made out of wood and <clears throat> he knew that he also needed to make a hole down pulley because they were running continuous loop at that time and on undulating land if the line was higher than the ground wasn't close to the ground a dog could snag the line on his leg and that line could do as much damage as the pulley did to Lando's leg. So with those two pulleys out of wood, Enjoy began in 1979. That's that's a that's a great story, and I, I don't know that I'd heard that it was a safety concern that or, or, you know originated oh, the uh, the motivation. That's that's what, that's, that's what, that's what um, prompted Tommy to go into action. He was looking for something. He wanted something to do other than accounting, um, yeah. but he hadn't found the niche and. This gave him the opening, and from and there. And just for our expanded. viewing audience, that's uh, that's Tom there over your shoulder, right? It is. Yeah. So Back what was his? Working. What was the next? Uh, you know, hurdle to from those jump two over pulleys, for, he started. He started with a standard machine, um, a take up wheel, and a drive, and the drive wheel. The initial drive wheel was um, pretty crude, but he expanded into the stainless steel wheel that. Um, he that's continued to make be made now. And he was. Were there any competitors those, in those 80, days? 80, did, were there any competitors in those days, or did each club kind of fashion their own equipment? Yeah, Bud Pine had equipment. Lyle Gillette had equipment, but Tommy was the first one that sort of made it to sell. <clears throat> and what was it he found about that that needed to be done for the the motor that pulls the the lure? He found a Ford starter motor, <clears throat> vintage 56 to 61, and he started using those to make the original machines. He morphed from there later on. By, um, by mid-80s, he was using, first of all, the, the pulleys themselves, plus the um, stands for the machines were very labor intensive. <clears throat> he would make um, 30 to 60 pulley parts at a time. He believed in Henry Ford's um, assembly line type of manufacturing. So he had two uprights. At that point, they were in a house because he didn't have a shop yet that were out of four by fours and they had pegs in two sides. So he could make um, 30 bases at a time or 60 if he had two of them going because he cut them out of wood. They were made out of maple. He then sanded and varnished them three times each before he actually put the pulleys together. Did the same thing with the machines, although they were, yeah, did the same thing with the machine, the machine frames and the take-up wheels were also made out of um, hardwood plywood. By the mid eighties, he, he started using UHMW for part of the pulleys, which saved some time um, in the nineties, 
I finally convinced him to retire in 94 and do enjoy full time because he couldn't keep up with the demand. Um, and at that point in time, he had invested in a mold for the pulleys. That's when the plastic pulleys started. He got on the web in 99 with a website. Before that, we did annual catalogs, which we mailed out to the fancy. He was discovered by falconers to train their birds. And um, the National Zoo and um, DeWitt um, Conservation in Africa found him to provide equipment for the cheetahs. So that in those early he, days, how did he uh, let let the lure coursing community know that he he that Enjoy was there that they were making equipment? Well, did he go he to had, did he do he demonstrations at trials? He, he had a price list. He would send it out, um, and we were at trials a lot in Hanover, um, in Massachusetts. We ran our own trials. We were in trials in um, Canada, Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa. Um, and word just got around. And then he had a mailing list from ASFA. And then as people would, um, like when the Falconers found him, he just added to the mailing list. We sent out catalogs, ultimately, once a year to the entire mailing list. And then it changed when he got on the web. Um, Were there pieces of equipment that he was always kind of tinkering with and trying to improve as he went along? He made everything from scratch. He learned how to make all the axles. He threaded the axles. He cut his own stainless steel. But he continually was striving to make better equipment, better performance. But his first concern was safe, safety for the dogs and then the cats. And did he, in addition to sending equipment off to Africa, did he sell all over the world? Were there lure horsing Ultimately, clubs yes. in other countries that he sold uh, to? Yes. Ultimately, we ended up selling all over the world. Um, zoos, probably 20 zoos nationwide and another 15 worldwide. Um, preserves in Africa, Dubai, UAE, Australia, um, obviously in Canada. What about folks in professional greyhound racing? Did they ever uh, have need of the equipment that uh, Enjoy made? And, um, Kansas City uses the equipment. Yeah. What um, uh, What did he? What was his most favorite piece of equipment to to make and work on? Do you think? Any of it. He <laughs> loved being in the shop. In 1982, we built the house that I'm in now. And instead of finishing the house, we took the money to finish the house and he built a 1,200 square foot shop, which is outfitted with every piece of equipment known to man to work with wood and then ultimately with also with metal, because then a metal lathe. And he was in his happy place in yeah. the shop. Yeah. He could live in the shop 24 7 and he'd have been happy as a clam. Yeah. What, uh, what role did you play in the company? Initially, um, just encouraging him, I kept, prior to the web, I kept the mailing list on the computer back in the days of DOS <laughs> and Word, which uh, Eddie and Selma probably don't know, but... Yeah, yeah um, I remember DOS. <laughs> <laughs> that was what we started with. And um, when he retired, he, he also did consulting work because Enjoy wasn't going to support us. Um, I was working full time. I carried the benefits, so that was helpful. But he did consulting work, and it was always out of town. So I became more involved then, talking to customers, um, taking orders. Um, but I didn't ever make the equipment. I got did you do more any of the shipping? Did you do huh? the shipping department? <laughs> no. Although <clears throat> once Tommy was um, diagnosed with cancer. Um, I ended up doing a lot of the packing under his direct supervision, by the way, so that it was done <laughs> perfectly Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. everything arrived perfectly. Right. I can remember I had some correspondence with him when, when our club started having a, a lure coursing program and he was always very helpful. He, you know, there was no newbie that was too ignorant 
uh, no. for him to answer ask question answer questions. There was no stupid question as far as he was concerned, and he was always, as you say, joyful about the way he went about relating to people. He felt strongly that the lower coursing world had given him um, a passion and a mission in life, and he felt strongly that he needed to give back to the lower coursing world in terms of education. So he was very happy to work with people um, and teach them. Not everybody thought he was the most pleasant dude in the world, but <laughs> Tommy was a maverick. <laughs> now you mentioned the cancer. What Tell us about what happened with Tom. <clears throat> he was diagnosed in 05 with a very rare soft tissue sarcoma in his left bicep. And the um, initial treatment was to save the arm because that was his livelihood. In 2007, um, the treatment changed to, we need to save your life. So he ultimately lost the arm at the shoulder or above the shoulder, which meant he couldn't keep enjoy going. And um, I convinced him to take on a partner. And Jim and Dale Healy had been friends since the mid-70s. They had whippets. We had done trials together. Um, Jim knew the equipment. He knew how to run the equipment. Um, and he had was one of those that was given early retirement from IBM. So we talked to him, and he agreed to work with Tommy for two years. And they worked together for two years, September 07 till September 09. And they went through the entire line of equipment with the sole exception of the cooling fan. And when Tommy made equipment, he made a year's supply at a time. So when he died... We had ample stock of everything except the cooling fan. And after he died, Tommy's idea was that Jim would have the business. Um, and Jim and I talked. He didn't want to do it by himself. So he and I became partners. And we did it together. I initially took over the website, which was on front page and going to die. So I had to learn how to do web design. <laughs> um, so I did the website and then... When I retired in 15, I took over the books and put them on QuickBooks. And as time went on, I talked to more and more customers. And yeah, so. What and, and, and was it, until, after Tom passed away, was it still, was Enjoy still run out of the shop there in your home in Vermont? Um, all the equipment was here. Jim had a small shop at his house and he ended up doing a lot of the work at his house. But any of the big equipment was here. So he came down on a fairly regular basis to use it. And then bring us forward from there and, and what led to your ultimate decision to, um, to sell the business. Jim had wanted to run the business until he was 80, which would have meant another three years. But he was diagnosed with terminal cancer in June. Um, so we came to the decision that we needed to sell the business. Both of us wanted to keep it going if we could and keep Tom's legacy alive. Um, it's good. It's great equipment and there are people around the world that depend on it and love it. So uh, fortunately, Eddie had sent us an email a couple of years ago saying he was interested if, he, if we ever decided to sell. So I contacted him and then... Um, he wrote back and said, yes, he was interested. And then I immediately went out and did due diligence because what was important to me was that it be sold to the right person. Otherwise, I would just close the business um, because the, the name was out there. It had a great reputation. So I wasn't just going to sell it to anybody. And by now, Jim was not able to help at all. So this was all now with me. And I went to people who I thought might know Eddie and didn't tell them why I was asking, but asked about him and his wife. And um, I got glowing reports back. And I asked what I considered to be the ultimate question and said, would you sell them a puppy? And when that came back, yes, I said, I found the right person. And I have very strong connections with Tommy, even though he's been gone for 14 years now, 15 years. Um, and I think Tommy was very much in approval of the Comanex buying the business because I think I would have had a very clear sign if it was not right. 
So yeah, that's great. You know, <clears throat> it it's it kept saved you from having to go find a buyer, uh, and uh, absolutely you know, all the protracted nature I mean, other people were interested, but I was the due diligence with anybody else did not set well. So yeah, yeah, I knew I'd found the right. I knew I'd found the right person, or the right person had come forward. Yeah, we just needed. And now to you get to see the, the setup. And uh, the, um, what do you think? Is I I told them we were talking before um, the podcast, and I I said to Selma, I said, "You're married to my husband." <laughs> he said, "He's another Tom." Yeah, yeah. I I saw the setup in his shop, and I said, "Bianchi's smiling." That's the way <laughs> Tommy kept his shop. <laughs> he was he was he was channeling he, Tom. He everything everything had its. Sp- space in the shop and i told them if i went over to the shop when tommy was alive and i'd go to the shop and borrow anything the rule was it went back in exactly the same place when i was done clean and that meant in the same place in the same drawer between the same two wrenches if it happened to be a wrench (laughs) and eddie's got this shop set up the same way yeah that's great well uh eddie and selma let's go over to you uh, tell us a little bit about your background in lure coursing, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit about your decision to uh, acquire Enjoy. I'll let whoever wants to go first go first. You want to go first? You heard? All right. So our, I, I will start with the very beginning, and then Eddie will do the next. So essentially, our very first lure coursing trial was 2004. We had a year-old Afghan hound boy puppy named Joey. He ended up being our first confirmation champion. And we took him to a, a junior coursing test and he passed and we were so proud. We had never actually seen coursing. Um, we were enthralled and we lived in a tiny townhouse with a stamp of a yard. So <laughs> the only exercise he got was me walking him around for a few miles a day, but he really didn't get open running. So when he did and he ran beautifully, we were ridiculously proud, you know? And so that was our first experience with, with lure coursing. Um, and then we started coursing more with our second dog, Reza. Uh, she was our first competitive dog. Joey liked it, but he was never that in, he was never super competitive. Let's put it that way. But Reza really, really liked it. And she got her field championship. Um, she got us more hooked into it. Now, when we started, Eddie was always very helpful with our hounds. However, if you're married to a crazy woman with Afghan hounds who's taking you to coursing, you know, and he was very helpful with the hounds, but he didn't know how to be involved. And Eddie's an engineer and he wants to help. And so once Les Pekarski at an event near Atlanta took him under his wing. And I think he noticed that Eddie was looking at the machine, like the lure machine. And it really started from then. He said, you know what? Come on, you know, let, let's do this. Let's do that. That's a solenoid. You know, it's a take up wheel, blah, blah, blah. Before I knew it, my husband was more into coursing than I was. You know, he was finding the coursing events. He was going out there. He actually went to coursing events without me. And he never, ever went to a show without me. You know, and I was in you know, medical school at this point. I was busy, so I, I was okay with him going to coursing events without me. But the fact that he was willing to go to coursing events in absence of me was a huge, you know, change. And anyway, fast forward by probably 2010, I mean, we were very, very heavily involved. We got our first, our foundation bitch, who was our first amazing courser. She ended up getting six or seven best in fields. I mean, she was just fantastic. And uh, that ended up being the first dog we bred. Um, And that really, we were just down this rabbit hole. You know, we were going to keep showing, obviously, but coursing was incredibly important, was such a beautiful test of a a hunting dog's prowess. Um, And then to cap it off, and I will pass it on to Eddie because he knows way more about the machines, et cetera, than I do. Uh, We went open field coursing in 2009 in New Mexico, and we saw live game. (laughs) And I do agree with Lyle Gillette, the founder of organized lure coursing that obviously gave birth to Enjoy Later um, and, you know, with Tom's talent, et cetera. But that is the true test because these hounds are running a mile, two miles, three miles 
poor jackrabbit. And when we saw that, and we've been now probably half a dozen times, it is literally mind blowing. And so I think all of these experiences helped to shape us into uh, people who really wanted to dedicate a good bit of their life to breeding better performance dogs that could also be rewarded in the ring. And so part of that was building our own coursing club. So when we bought our farm in 2014 in December, our very first coursing trial was held December of 2015. And that was with Enjoy Products. Um, you know, Eddie purchased his first pulleys back in 2006 for the Atlanta Afghan Hound Club. Um, but yeah, so anyway, it's been a long time coming. Um, I guess in 2000, I guess this year, sweetheart, it'll be 20 years since Joey ran his, uh, his junior courser. But yeah, now, now to Eddie. <laughs> well, I, I can remember the first time I met you all was at Old Mill Farm in Cartersville, yep. Georgia. And yep. Eddie, you both were pretty young, skinny people. And um, uh, I looked over and Eddie was slipping an Afghan hound and he had a, a camcorder in one hand. I said, yep. this guy will never be able to do this, but he did. And, you know, he had equipment from day one in his hand. Uh, so Eddie, let's go over to you. What, what sparked your interest in the equipment particularly? It was just such an engineering anomaly. Uh, it was so fascinating just walking up to the equipment and watching it run, you know, these motors run at 60 miles an hour and just being able to run these dogs around a field. And, um, it, the equipment was fascinating, but then I really got interested in lure operation. And like when Les and Steve Curry, like were able to put me up on the stand and getting that going. And I always think like there's a kind of kinship between the lure operator and the machine. Cause like you can hear how fast the dog is going by how fast they're pulsing, how fast the machine is running. And if something goes wrong, you know, when that bolt snaps and the wheel comes spinning off or whatever happens. So like, there's always a close tie. And my favorite thing, like oh, both of, both of us are uh, lure coursing judges. Uh, but I think my favorite thing to do on the field is like lure operate. And um, we've, I think our first uh, reversible machine was built in our townhouse. Um, and I remember like trying to figure out how you run two solenoids at the same time on our kitchen floor and putting that all together. Uh, and we used to run practices in, uh, Alabama, but just, and, and having sight hounds and getting them to do what they were instinctually bred to do for, you know, millennia is just fascinating. And, you know, we all live East of the Mississippi and we can't all go open field coursing every other weekend. So this is the closest thing to it and it's a really good uh evaluation tool for us as breeders just to see the dogs and we know you know over time they might start cheating or whatever but just getting a good grip on what these dogs are capable of um chasing a plastic bag is just amazing to me so and just you know honestly having the opportunity to buy enjoy is amazing like it would probably it, it's gonna it's it's changed our lives and we have a new direction to go now. And I'm just very excited. Uh, Eddie, were you some, were you somebody that was interested in, you know, automotive things? Did you have to, or, or was learning the starter motor, uh, kind of the, um, the beginning of your, uh, automotive related, uh, engineering interests? Well, uh, my first car was a 76 Chevy Nova with 350 in it. And, uh, we did a lot of the engine rebuild on it. So no, that wasn't my first automotive thing. But I mean, these these are all electrical motors, and by trade, I'm an electrical engineer, so it wasn't a big leap to start playing with these machines. Yeah, yeah. Well, for our folks that don't really know, you know what, how how lure coursing is done. Uh, basically, it's a it's a lure that's pulled around uh, on a field by a string uh, that simulates a hair on the run, and there has to be something that pulls that. And so, why don't we start with with talking about the motor, you're going to, you're going to give us a few visual aids here for our folks watching on YouTube. Let's show, show us the motor. That's kind of the heart of the, the sport. There it is. And, uh, and, and point out what you've got there. Is that, I see two solenoids, I think. Sorry to so make you hold it actually, up like that. Yeah. I'll let you know when my arms start shaking, but this okay. is a reversible oh, machine. Honey? No, no, no. I got it. So this, the, it has two solenoids on it. And basically, you've got a switch in addition to the button on it to say which direction it's going. And that changes which of the two solenoids fires. 
and it create, creates a circuit. And these things run, I don't know the exact RPMs on them, but they'll push a bunny till about 60 miles an hour. Yeah. So, and it's got like a voltmeter on top. Um, honey, grab the, uh, grab the orange cord switch right there. This guy? Yeah, right in front of you. Yep. Yeah, got it. Coming. Put this down for a sec. And so this is a reversible switch right here. Uh -huh. And it's got the forward or reverse direction and yeah. then a button on it. And that's that. That's not the one that's most typically used by clubs, right? Most of them have no, the one, one direction. We use a very simple micro switch that just looks like this. Yeah. With a little button on it. Right. And it just plugs into the machine. What was it that uh, motivated Tom to choose the that the old Ford starter motor? Was there some particular aspect of it that uh, that? It was the reason he chose it as the starting point. I think it was the length of the shaft. The yeah. shaft was long enough to hold the wheels. So he could put a take up wheel on the shaft or a um, continuous loop wheel on the shaft. Yeah. Yeah. Nice <laughs> See the length of the it. shaft. So th that's taken from an electric starter motor that was used to start Fords back in the, in the sixties. 56 to 61. Uh, and Eddie, what, um, Obviously, it's it's got to have electric power. What what provides the electric <laughs> power to the um, to the to the motor? Well, they're all twelve volt DC motors, um, and they're hooked straight to a car battery. Typically, normally we use a deep discharge marine battery or two per motor. So when I run my trials, I usually have about four of those RV marine batteries, uh, all connected in parallel, uh, feeding two machines. Okay, that's what provides the, the go for the hair. Uh, what makes the turns? Uh, those are pulleys. Pulleys. <laughs> Show us one of those, if you will. Let me find the standard corner. So we actually produce three different kinds of pulleys. Let me see if I can hold all three up at once. You mean yeah. to hold them? So yeah. in the center is a standard corner pulley uh, on the... I guess you're Can you move your hand? Is... The other way. Which way? What? To your right. So there you go. Show the short one. So yeah. here's the shorter pulley. There you right, go. right. <laughs> right. And that's a standard pulley in the middle and then a high top pulley. Now, most of us just use the standard pulley and that runs the plastic bag on a nylon uh, braided scent twine around the course. Yeah. Now, if the you're high doing corner, a lot of, what's that? The high corner pulleys were requested by um, falconers and greyhound people for bigger lures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'll accommodate a thicker lure. Is right. that is that one of, the, one of the reasons to have it? Yeah. And then what about the low profile? What's it? Uh, what's its primary application? Trina can answer. <laughs> Shorter to the ground, um, dogs less able to hit it. Yeah. Whip it, people. Right. I think right. likely if you had a pretty flat field, you know, um, that would work. Right. But yeah, the pulley is constructed of a stainless steel tube with two uh, kind of nylon tops and bottoms with a cap on it, uh, two stainless steel ball bearings with a stainless steel actual shaft through it. Um, and then a hinge on the bottom that you put the nail through like this and it comes over the nail and then the string runs on that side of it. Yeah. Now, are you continuing Tom's uh, tradition of building everything from scratch? <laughs> uh, I haven't gotten into plywood yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> I want to go back to the uh, plywood take up wheels at some point because I do like those. Yeah. Landon and have, uh, not to interrupt, some Colorado Police, ah. or maybe just one, but this was made for the Colorado clubs. And and Trina, you may be able to shed some light on the very special shape of this. They called it a teardrop pulley, and they wanted it <clears throat> so that it would work better in their terrain. And I'm not quite sure why, but he custom designed those for clubs in Colorado. 
and okay. yeah, I, I mean, he's beautiful. I, I was like, oh, <laughs> unique. <laughs> And then, Eddie, last but not least, the hold down. Trina has explained sure. what that's for. Tell, show us that a little bit. So there's basically two types of hold down. There's like the traditional hold down. And the way that's different is instead of going around a corner, you're just holding the string down to the ground. Mm -hmm. And you've got eyelets right here and there and on both sides. And then you have aluminum strips right here that if the, if the string comes off a pulley further down the line, it doesn't cut through the side of the plastic. Mm -hmm. So it's a like little protector right there. But anyway, that's just to hold the string down to the ground. And then you've got an optional box pulley, which is a little bit rarer. And it's got eyelets on one side, it's a little bit narrower, and it's got a hinge on the other. So it could be used either as a corner or as a hold down. Mm -hmm. And then last but not least is the string. Tell us about what string is, is commonly used to to pull the, the lures? Well, it depends on your application. If you're running lure coursing, you're going to want to use nylon. Uh, nylon's a little bit stretchier. It's not as prone to breaking under tension. Uh, and it's a 24 pound braided scent twine. So, and um, we sell it in 500 yard spools. Uh, but if you're doing racing, then you might go over to the uh, poly line. And that has a little bit less stretch to it, but it's a little bit better if you're doing a drag lure. Um, or racing or whatever, it's not as jerky on the lure and it doesn't like, it's not as janky. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Does that, does the, 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 does the nylon get ultimately stretched all the way and it doesn't stretch anymore? Or will it always be stretchy? There's always some stretch to it, but yeah, there's a little bit of a break in period that first day where you kind of want the line to settle, but then the nylon line, it'll last anywhere from six months to a year, as long as it's taken care of and you're not running over too many hills like we are here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, um, what, let's go now to your, your and Selma's decision to purchase enjoy. Tell us about the background on that. Trina mentioned the, the email. Well, you, you want sent to talk a about the wheels first? Ah, oh, the wheels. Yes, yes, oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let's do the drive wheel first. I completely sure. forgot. Okay, so this is an, a fascinating and ingenious design, and the steel plates are actually spun in the USA and put together here. But it, I never really understood until I saw somebody try to use like a pulley off of an assembly line and how much that string, string stri uh, like slips on the wheel. But what happens is the two wheels under tension actually grab that nylon string and are able to propel it around the course. So it's a really fascinating just use of like static friction to grab it. And that's why lure operators are pulsing the line the whole time because you're letting that like static friction grab the nylon string and throw it out. And without these wheels, we could not run lure coursing. Yeah. And I think uh, like a lot of people were freaking out because when Enjoy, you know, stopped selling products, we were no longer able to get our pulleys and wheels. And without this, we can't run dogs. Yeah. And so Trina did Tom invented that. He he came up with the idea of the two I call them the two pipe they, plates. When Tommy got into it, they were already running um continuous loop, but the wheel was nothing like this. It was a for lack of the probably the correct word, it was more primitive. Um and Tommy designed this. He started with another um wheel, continuous loop wheel, um, and he wasn't happy with it. And he found these spun pans and he designed and created that wheel that Eddie's holding. And it worked great. So Eddie, do you, the components come to you from a vendor and then you uh, assemble them there in the shop? Yep. I cannot spin steel. <laughs> you don't have that equipment yet. So, He's going to buy the yeah, pans we, and then. We have to have the plates made for us. Yes. And then, but like we do all the drilling, all the assembly, like all Honey, the. You show the milling uh, machine. Oh yeah, the milling machine is the milling machine. You should see this. What this is that? Nineteen forty-eight. This was there my first go. steel wheel that I put together today. So, oh, excellent, excellent. Yes, very exciting. Are, the, are you going to start numbering them? Oh, do you see it? Oh, take yeah. your phone. Yeah, we can we see have it. A nineteen forty-eight milling machine, which is amazing. <laughs> oh, forty-two. Sorry. But, yeah. There we are. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that is amazing. So what all what what do you use that for beside the, the the drive wheels? 
everything else? Um, yeah, it's actually used to do the hubs on both the continuous loop and the take-up wheel. Um, we're using it to drill all of the holes in the continuous loop and the take-up wheels as well, as far as like uh, attaching the hubs. Um, we're not machining fine parts really, but it it it's really good for uh, especially getting through the hubs. Yeah, and uh, it, there's a computerized aspect to it. So there's actually a keyboard and an input station, if you will, uh, that was added on way later. So even though it's a very old machine, you can actually program it to do certain steps in sequence. Yeah, it's got a DRO on it and stuff. So yeah, you know where you are in space and time. Before long, you'll be developing the software for it, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, well, there's... There's a good chance we might get into CNC for some of these plates and all that. So yeah, yeah. We'll see. All right. Uh, we've got the drive wheel. Now let's have the take up wheel. Sure. So this is the take up wheel. And so uh, tell us about the functions to, of, it, of it. So it's used to store string a lot of the time or run string out, but it's also used for racing applications. Um, or continue, or I'm sorry, not continuous loop, but uh, drag lore. Mm -hmm. So um, we run drag a lot on our property. We usually run in uh, March and November. Um, and the benefits of that is um, the dog is actually chasing something large, like a fur or squawker, mm -hmm. and they're chasing that. And it's a lot more enticing than a plastic bag simply is. Um, and we use it, uh, we run Legra almost once a month on the property and we always use a take up wheel for that. The, the downside is you have to restring the course every time on a four wheeler or scooter, or whatever right. you're, if you, if you feel like running. Yep. I, I ran like 17,000 steps in three <laughs> hours. one time. That will you be changing that one? Any Eddie, that, that um, take up wheel. We, we've got a lot of plastic and we're um, going to be producing plastic wheels for a while. Um, if we get comfortable in the shop and I feel like doing it, maybe we'll go to plywood. We'll see. Um, it, I rather, I'm, I'm probably going to move to a CNC machine before we start doing plywood um, just for precision parts. Um, I think that's a huge benefit to having computerized everything, being able to slap a, a plate or a disc down and have it like just nail the holes and not have to match up uh, a disc before we drill it each time. Mm -hmm. So I want to move to something a little bit more automated with CNC before we start playing with uh, wood products. But eventually, I would like to go back to plywood to take up wheels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what's the advantage of plywood over the plastic? Um, you, they're a little bit more resilient, in my opinion. A little less prone to like stretching, mm -hmm. bowing, and heat damage. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we had and we had you, a plastic one. And if one you and put we... a brake on them, mm -hmm. uh, like if you're if you're running a drag lure, you kind of want to brake on the side of it. And I right. I I prefer it on the side of wood than I do plastic. Mm -hmm. Now, what else uh, have we covered? All the equipment at this point, I think we have. But you tell me. I think well, one thing. I know oh, the enjoy fans. yeah yeah the fans. <laughs> I know Enjoy for a while stopped producing fans, but in my opinion, if you're running any kind of lower course, you have to have a fan on that motor. So with every motor, we're going to be sending a fan out with the motor. So, and it's, it's a large DC fan. It's a lot quieter than the ones I currently use. So it's really nice. It's got an on off switch on the top of it. And it literally just goes onto the motor and you screw clamp it and you can like leave it on the motor, which is a nice benefit. Yeah. I can remember Tom saying heat is your enemy when it comes to the motors, tell us, tell us why that is. Oh yeah. He, well, when you start from a dead stop with these DC motors and you click the button, you've got solenoids that are rated for about 200 amps. Uh, when you first click that button, that inrush current's about 800 amps. And so that inrush current is enough to not only fuse the contacts on the solenoid over time, but also overheat the uh, core on the motor that heat builds up in that core and eventually you're going to smoke a motor if you're not keeping fan on it and keeping air ventilated and taking your time sometimes like not running cat tests end to end to end yeah yeah what um what was what modifications did, did tom or his vendors 
make to the old Ford starter motor to more accommodate it to the demands of lure coursing? I don't think they, I don't think he made any. I think he used it as is. Eddie could probably answer that better than I. And, and well, they, what about the current motor now, Eddie? How is it different from what would have been the old automotive starter motor? I think, didn't they go from like two windings to four? Or Isn't that right? I don't they, know. I, th I think that's what I recall reading. a little bit more reading. dense, a little bit more powerful. And I think they went up in the horsepower on each motor just a bit. Yeah. Now, with all machinery... You have breakdowns. You have weak points. What what are the where what are the weak points in lure coursing equipment? Well, definitely, like you said, heat. You got to stay on top of that. Um, we've been having a lot of trouble. Like, and there's nothing in Joy Cells, but like chargers. Chargers have gotten a lot cheaper over the last twenty years, and we're having a hard time keeping current on the batteries. Um, I usually recommend associated equipment. Um, but yeah, we've had a lot of Shoemaker chargers over the last few years. And um, what was that other one? The Farm and Ranch charger, we've just had a lot of issues with. But yeah, just keeping enough current into the batteries, because it's not like you just run on a battery all day. You have to put, keep putting power into it. And we usually mm -hmm. run a small inverter generator and some kind of uh, charger into the batteries. Um, that's been a lot of the issue. I haven't had any issues with pulleys or hold downs. Honestly, Enjoy, like, we've got pulleys that we bought 20 years ago. Like, Enjoy has never been a problem for equipment. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names, but maybe when I was at the II, I saw two of the uh, continuous loop wheels. And if you're not a good lure operator and you're not listening to your machines and you snap that line and you start taking up line on the continuous loop wheels and you build up enough string in there to spread the plates, you've just smoked your continuous loop wheel. And that's a $250 wheel right there. Wow. So... Be very careful about building up string and spreading those plates because if you can see the bolts through the crack, done. Done. Mm -hmm. Somebody put a foot on that spinning wheel and and, yeah. and stop it as soon as yes. you can, right? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Now and then, what? Which of these components are typically purchased by racing clubs as opposed to lure coursing clubs? Oh, we've got the racing wheel, honey. Do you have that? The what? The racing wheel. The we even have a Jack Russell racing wheel. Mm. It's right back there if you want to grab it on the shelf. Um, as far as racers, they mostly buy lure, um, the, sometimes the low pulleys, uh, high pulleys. If, see, with racing, you never really go around the pulleys, so it's not really a big concern. Eddie, we'll go get it. <laughs> ah, there we go. Sorry. So... This is a Jack Russell Terrier racing wheel. It's smaller with a smaller diameter spindle in the middle. So when uh -huh. you first hit that button, it doesn't move as fast. Whereas with a big take up wheel, you've got a much larger diameter wheel yeah. in there. Right. And it's gonna it's gonna hit that lure so much faster. But and anyway, so Jack racers, Russell Jack Russell Terrier racing is all drag lure, I take it. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Very short spurts. Uh, but the racers, I mean, for the most part, they're not going around pulleys. They might prefer a uh, low pulley, especially with uh, Notra, if they're running a uh, closed loop, then they want to mm -hmm. keep it low. Um, yeah. But no, for the most part, it's just a take up wheel or continuous loop with them. It's very similar to lure coursing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, let's talk a little and bit like about folks with face masks and gloves at the end <laughs> for the Jack Russell right. racing. Right. Um, <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what led to your decision to uh, to to approach Trina about the possibility of buying Enjoy. Well, initially, I mean, two years ago, well, three years ago, when I contacted Trina the first time, you know, I was just looking around. I was just like, well, you know, Enjoy is probably not going to last forever. And if, uh, you know, there's no more Enjoy, there's no more lure forcing, in my opinion. So there's nobody who produces equipment of this caliber. And so I contacted her and just, you know, put the email out there and really didn't think of anything about it for two years. And then she, Trina contacted me, I think it was in August. And it was just like, oh, God, you know, it's time to buy Enjoy. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to do this. But it was just like, well, we've got to do this for the sport, for everybody else, for our dogs, 
this has to be done. So we're now company owners and, you know, uh, we'll absolutely love producing Enjoy and keeping the sport running. But yeah, it, it, it's been honestly a month, like a month since we purchased the company, a month since like the inventory arrived, since we started setting up shop, getting everything unpacked, buying a milling machine and like learning how to do inventory and how to send a PO. I had no idea how to do that. <laughs> so it's been a lot, but it's, I, I'm, I'm really happy with where we are. I'm super excited. Um, we just launched the website public. I sent out the email to 68 people, all of our back orders saying, you know, here's the website. You guys have been wanting products, buy something like we're ready to ship. Have, have you been able to catch your breath yet in terms of, uh, you know, feeling like you've got everything ready to go and you've got some of your back orders filled and so forth? Well, we haven't filled a back order yet. Like I'm waiting on those orders to come in. Uh, I made two wheels and I promised them to paint. <laughs> so that's what I did. Because <laughs> things said, I want your first two wheels. So I did it for her. We have plenty of in inventory, honestly. And uh, Guy and Eddie are working in the shop. Uh, but a lot of the back orders are up to nine months old. So we're recontacting them and asking, hey, do you still need product? Because what if they made their own or went to another company? Um, and so we'll deal with them first for the first week or two. And then Eddie will open up the shop to everyone. Excellent. Now, um, what roles will the two of you play? Uh, somebody the CEO and somebody's the CFO or how, how are you defining your roles within the company? <laughs> I'm the CNO chief neurosurgical <laughs> officer. I, I'm here to, you know, be the cheerleader. I honestly, I will, I will say I have been really instrumental with website design. Um, I wrote much of the print. Um, I like, I, I, I'm very like, English literature kind of. So anyway, the, the, that's me. Eddie does all the engineering, all the actual building, uh, making sure everything is perfect. And that that's who it should be. Yeah. You know, don't please don't make me build a machine. That is well, not I was just going to ask if, if there was a machine that needed <laughs> surgery, so to speak, and with your neurosurgery skills, do you think you could get in there and tinker around and find the problem and fix it? <laughs> I'm like, hold on. Uh, maybe if I had a shunt programmer, but yeah, no, no. I mean, I'm here, you know, I, we are partners in this, um, you know, love you, sweetheart. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, Eddie is definitely the, the brains and the brawn. Yeah. I think Sam is our angel investor for him. There you are. There you are. <laughs> well, no, no, but <laughs> I love you, sweetheart. You know what I mean? Like I'm here, like, well, it's your you run. So Eddie right now, is it essentially a full-time job? Absolutely. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're at it from Eddie's doing this six to eight yeah, hours a day. That's amazing. And then what, what, what do you, what, what's your other, uh, advoc or vocation? Is it, is it all enjoy now or do you do something else? Farm owner. <laughs> yep. Yep. And we have 103 acres in East Tennessee. We've got three horses, 12 chickens, seven Afghan hounds. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a full-time job yeah, to between me. Between that. I mean, I do some programming on the side, handling websites, recording secretary for our parent club. Um, what else? You're on the board of the parent club. Yeah, the board. Yeah, we do. We do enough. Staying busy. Well, you're there in the nerve center, the new nerve center of Enjoy. Can you give us a little pan of the uh, some uh, of the Ooh, camera? Yeah, do it, honey. And show us uh, what everything sure. looks like. This is a shed that you had, right? It was a you housed your tractors this in. Yeah, tractor it's a big shed. tractor yeah. shed. It's about. 75 feet by 40 feet. It's yeah. big. It's a big so area. That's a little work area that we're putting wheels together and we're assembling. So behind, oh, there's a oh, show the island. Of, the what? I did. The island, the workbench thing. I will. And so, <laughs> yeah, that's a cart full of pulleys right there. So we're putting those together. And then there's the big milling machine. And as we walk back, it's really weird looking at the Honey, show the milling machine. I think he's just a like a marvel. Oh, okay. He so, is. He's from nineteen the nineteen forties, guys. Nineteen forty two. Milling machine. Look at him. And by the but way, it's show the computerized, computerized part. It. Yeah. So that get that gives you your position in time and space. So it's very useful. 
especially when you're like manually doing everything. But it does have like, you know, uh, power feeding. So that's very nice on the table. And by the way, John, if you would like to buy one of these, even from the 40s, you're looking at ten to thirty thousand wow. dollars. And we just got a really good deal in Knoxville. Yeah, yeah they're very yeah, pull expensive. Pulleys getting glued together right yeah. there. I didn't know there was epoxy in them, but there was. <laughs> Guy then, did 87 today. So these are all of our uh, wheel parts down here, uh, motors on the mid shelf, and then fan supplies on the top. And then we've got some pre-assembled uh, pulleys through here. We bought a lot of crates to fit everything. You guys can't tell. Uh, wires there, boards for the stands. Cables, uh, show the is... cables. Oh, I love the cables. <laughs> so this is like pulley part corner. Yeah. <laughs> and then behind me are is like all the hardware shelf. Do you see all this, John? Like yeah. So much. Hundreds yeah, of components. Yeah. Yes. And then this is the master shelf right through there. So this is where we keep like the parts that were originally made by Tom and that we reference for how to make stuff. And then as we move down, this is where the finished parts are going to go. So as you can tell, there's not many finished parts. <laughs> A pretty empty shelf right there. And then these are some of the fascinating jigs that uh, Tom put together. So you've got like table crimpers up here. This is actually a wild jig for uh, cutting the discs in the middle of the wheel and the large plywood wheels. And then he's got a jig back here for drilling holes in the wooden pulley. This is for clamping down the wheels as you're like um, drilling them, I believe. And then that's for uh, drilling the large uh, pickup wheel. And that is another clamp wheel for, um, I think, just the take-up wheel and doing a deburring in the center of it. And that is a jig for doing the fan holes. I mean, Tom, like, Tom really set us up for success. Like, I might not have two years of shadowing under him, but I think we're in pretty good shape. So this is a fascinating wheel for uh, putting the 16 holes in the stainless steel and putting the center hub in. So just incredible. And then he's got several little like steel blocks just for putting the holes in the hub. And then there's another, this is for doing the like aluminum insert that goes in the take up wheel. You know, I never looked that close at some of the big wheels, but yeah, there's an aluminum tube on the inside of the take up. And then he even made another jig like this one, which is for putting a uh, the threaded um, screw into the stainless steel wheel. So on one side, you just do a straight drill through and on the other, you actually tap it. So yeah, this is us like working today and like producing the hubs for the take up wheels and the stainless steel wheels. So we were drilling those through today. So we're at, at the moment and for the foreseeable future until we can get caught up with back orders, we're going to be doing a, a two order kind of manufacturing process. But we're going to get to the point where we're going to be two store. So, you know, for three months, we're going to work real hard, put up a bunch of equipment for the year and get to the point where we could do like almost next day sales. But at this point, I'm assuming that the orders are going to come in and we're just going to be backed up and working as hard as we can just to catch up for the last year. Was was all, you just showed us the various parts and and pieces to to make the for the manufacturing process? Was this all written down somewhere, or did you just have to figure it out? Yes. Oh, thank God it was. Um, so yeah, like uh, Tom and Jim both took really good notes and with pictures. So you know, you could, it was almost color by numbers, like following the stuff. Use this machine at this point. Use this size tap and die, and it was just like very useful to go through that. But even then, you know, we figured out a couple things on our own. Like, you know, you could put the bolts into the hub, hold the pans together and drill them without having to just like have it be wobbly on the, you know, milling machine because that's not very useful. But yeah, they're like, it's still a learning process and we're learning as we're going. But I think, and I still can't figure out how to clamp the uh, uh, machine frames <laughs> together because like the little plastic things yeah. that I have slip right off the plastic. So we're, we're getting, we're getting there, but like, we'll, we'll be okay. Now, once you kind of get up and really running and you get the orders filled and you're you're producing for the store, 
and you have a little time to breathe, do you anticipate that the engineer in you will want to tinker with some of the components to see if you can improve them just as a matter of personal? Absolutely. Now that, now that it's my job, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> what do you, what do you, have you thought about what might be the first thing you'll uh, turn your attention to for fiddling and improvement? Well, I know the things that I've used over the past few years that I'd like to incorporate. So, you know, um, I, I'd like to redo the fan a little bit and maybe do a forced induction through the core of the machine uh, eventually. So um, there, there are a few things that I could see improving on the mousetrap. So, yeah, we'll, we'll <laughs> definitely go in that direction. Well, let me make two, let me challenge you to two suggestions. Um, and this, this is pertaining to drag lure. What we need it, we found is a, um, a a string tensioner that will will wind the uh, string as you're running a course, wind the string evenly on the take up wheel, like kind of like a fishing you see with a fishing rod, an open reel. You know, yeah. uh, we right now we have to use uh, exactly exactly, uh, okay. and what right now we have to use uh, a person holding a, what's basically a hay hook. Michael is our is one of our hook men. And it, yeah. it works quite well, but it obviously requires, you know, a human uh, to do it. And uh, so that would be one. And then the other would be um, we find that when we're restringing, you need somebody to, to sit down uh, with a brake pedal uh, so that when you slow down the string, restringing machine uh, it, and it freewheels, you've got to be able to stop it so that it won't, or at least slow it down so that it won't, uh, uh, you know, tangle. Uh, we've, we, we adapted a, a bass drum, um, pedal to, to do that. And again, it works just fine, but it's, um, it requires a human to sit there and, and, and watch and so forth. So, um, that would be a, that would be, a, I'll, I'll give you those two challenges for the future for, for, uh, lure coursing machinery. I've actually seen in Europe, they usually use mostly gas powered equipment and it's either run off a little Vespa or a chainsaw and some of those actually have those string minders that go back and yeah. forth and yeah. when they're restringing um as far as brakes go we usually use it's it's a big steel bar with honestly a boot sole on it that leans up against the wheel and just gives it just enough uh friction on it to keep it from freewheeling but yeah like it, that could be better yeah I and agree. if you, with yours, what you use, do you just lean it up against there and you don't need a person there to maintain the pressure? Well, that's good. Nope. That's good. Well, if you, if you can develop that tensioner and spooler, uh, we'll be your first customer. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what do you see as kind of the challenges for the future? What, um, in terms of just running the business and, and so forth? Honestly, handling the challenges of like, quite honestly, the vastly inferior competitors. You know, we've had people tell us, oh God, what's happening? We can't buy stuff from Enjoy. This was before we bought the company. You know, we tried a couple of other companies. The pulleys are garbage. Uh, stuff is falling apart. Uh, literally, the packages are $4,000, John, yeah, that... for eight pulleys and a machine. And we're nowhere near that, you know? And so it's, uh, long story short, the fast cat and cat people have come in and really started predating upon the market. And so I, I would like to see more honest pricing, good product, um, and people essentially just becoming loyal, going back to being loyal to us, yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah I, I've seen some of that. I wouldn't have it myself. I would, I'm an enjoy person from the yes. word go, but um, yeah, I've seen some of it and it's, you could never run a greyhound on it. I don't know that you could run a fast Afghan hound. On oh it. no, no, no! And in fact, yeah, absolutely. Somebody actually asked in a fast cat fast or Facebook uh, page yesterday, literally yesterday, and Eddie did not comment. He was a class act, but they said, "I'm thinking about this company," and Eddie didn't say anything. Someone <laughs> else said, "Oh no, no, you cannot run fast dogs with that yeah. stuff. Like you yeah. cannot. Like they were very, you know, unequivocal." Do you think, Eddie, there's any limit to the market? In other words, once all the clubs get, the existing clubs get their enjoy orders filled and they've, 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 they've kind of got their component of, uh, their complement of machinery and then sudden, and then and you see a decline in business or do you see it as a, 
as a growth, a growth industry, so to speak? Honestly, we didn't buy the company to make money. We bought the company to produce products that will last for lower coursing uh, enthusiasts. So, you know, I, I, I hope there's always growth and I hope lower coursing always continues, but like, I still want to produce pulleys that last somebody else 20 plus years. Yeah. So that's, you know, I, I, I really want to be known for quality. And I guess that's the problem with not, what, what is that called? Where, you know, you uh, planned obsolescence. Yes. Like mm -hmm. I don't ever want to produce something cheap that dies in five years and forces somebody to come back to me. I want the only killer of this to be my track. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, uh, you know, yeah, and go ahead, Selma. I'm sorry. Oh, the, literally the only two or three pulleys that we have been, you know, that we have killed have been ones by our tractor <laughs> because they've been left out in the field and we didn't realize they were out there. Uh, but we literally have our very first enjoys otherwise. Yeah. yeah. We've got, we've still got wooden base uh, pulleys um, that I bought from Tom a mm -hmm. long time ago mm -hmm. and they work like a charm. Michael yep. actually likes the wooden base better than the, uh, the plastic base, but we've heard that. <laughs> I know we, ha we still have several of the wooden hold downs. <laughs> I can but make no. 33 more wooden pull-downs, <laughs> and those are the last 33 yep, until I get yep. into woodworking. You ought to sell them <laughs> for a special price once that happens. We are, because they're special. You know, they're beautiful. Now, one growing aspect of the market I see that I, I hate to admit, but is the is the fast cats, which, you know, I'm I'm not high on the fast cats. But what do they, do they use Enjoy equipment, or what do those clubs use that you find? Yes. It's funny you ask, because... Uh, I have had several fast cat clubs that were champing at the bit more than some of the lure coursing clubs because like they've only heard to buy into it. So that is so reassuring to the future of this company we yeah, just bought. Yeah. So I'm, and, but we knew like enjoys the only company on the market worth producing or produces anything of worth. So. You know, it, it does not take much research for an owner of a German short hair pointer, a Doberman, you know, anything leggy with a little bit of speed, you know, and once you hear the other companies can't handle fast dogs, you start getting scared. You know, you're like, hmm, you know, I don't know. Like, I, should I release my, like, field GSP, you know, uh, in this circumstance? Yeah. yeah. Story right before we bought the company about a club that I think bought from another company, had all of their product break down in the field, and then was contacting Trina in panic because they had a, a, a trial to run. Trina can talk more about it. Yeah, it was a club in, in uh, Nova Scotia. <clears throat> and they had ordered, they had bought equipment from Gemini, <clears throat> excuse me, and then they had a fire. And it burned, the equipment was all lost in the fire. And they had other equipment because we, Jim at that point was too sick and we couldn't, I didn't have anything to send them. Send them. So they bought from um, one of our competitors, and the trial was a disaster. Um, nothing worked. It was terrible. Anyway, I found um, old pulleys and wheels that Tom had made, and I sent them to them gratis just to get them into their next trial. Um, yeah. So they were using old wooden pulleys and um, they were very grateful. But yeah, they, they had bought from um, a couple of competitors and the, the stuff did not work. Yeah. It all broke yeah. down. But it's interesting, John, that you asked the question about whether or not there's longevity because that was always Tommy's and my question back in the 80s. Is this going to continue? Um, are we going to saturate the market? But it has done nothing but the market especially the World Wide Web, the market just got bigger and bigger. Eddie, do you have so, any changes to, uh, you think you'll make to the website or do you think you'll keep it pretty much as is? Oh, the website? Yeah. Oh, it's already new. It's all oh, brand I new. I haven't visited. I yeah. need to do that. I should all have done it, my yep. homework before tonight's uh, It looks <laughs> great. Well, we haven't gone public ah, with it. We just went public we with are. that email to the back yeah. orders. So... I'm going to let them get the first bite at it and then I'm going to release it in yeah, another week. Yeah. Yeah. And he didn't think it would be fair to, you know, for folks who placed an order in June of 2023 <laughs> to then have to compete with people right, right now. Right. 
So anyway, in the next couple of weeks, we'll we'll go completely public. But the the website is ready to go. That's excellent, Eddie. I'll give you one more challenge. Awesome. Um, uh, and this is not motorized. There's a there was a machine called a drag master, hand cranked in England that the coursing people used oh, to God. exercise their dogs. It wasn't for competition. It was just, you know, they'd get them out on their gallops. They'd crank this thing. And I've seen it on video. I'll, show, I'll send you a picture of it at some point. And it was not a bicycle wheel as such. It was, it was a, made for this application. And I've seen it run on video and it's fast enough for greyhounds, you know, but it's just for, it's just Ooh. for like a 75 to hundred yard straight you know, for, for galloping exercise, but, um, I can, and, and they used to, you, you could buy it at one time, but nobody has them anymore. And so I think that might be a good for yeah. home for people that had enough space to run their dogs for exercise and, and conditioning. It might be a nice uh, application and that you just take it, you just wheel it out there. You don't have to set up a motor or, uh, you know, bring out batteries or anything like that, but uh, that might be a, uh, a thing for you to think about for the future. Wild. I'll, Tech study, I'll honestly. send you some pictures of it. <laughs> yeah. you know, if I can find video of it in application, cool. but it was called the drag master. I thought that was a pretty good name. Drag master. Okay. Cause I've seen the old Lyle Gillette yeah, machine right. with the hand crank bicycle uh -huh. wheel yeah. that was set up in uh, Les mm -hmm. Les's uh, house. Yeah, I remember yeah. seeing that. He had a glass box yes, over it. Yes, absolutely. And they used to have it on display at the uh, International Invitational. I can remember that. This is a little more, the one I'm thinking about was a little little more high tech than that, but not not a great deal. It was just a hand crank, you know, take up, basically. Yeah. But anyway, that, that can be a challenge for the future as well. Uh, so what what's next? What's next for the, the Comenix? In terms of enjoy, in terms of what Infinity you're going to do. and beyond. <laughs> I think just getting a wrap on enjoy getting into the sink, being able to produce for a few months and set up for the year. Um, I think that's mostly it. But yeah, keeping your customers happy and honestly not letting Trina and Tommy down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's no question that you're this, not going to. Like that, that's as you goal. said, this like, is a great service to not, the sport. You're not going to. Uh, because it keeps on, it keeps uh, Tom and 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 Trina's, no. <laughs> you know, what they created alive and and to the service of the sport. And you're right; if oh, without yeah. good equipment, you don't have lure coursing. Well, it's it's Not also the cheetah world. Tommy Tommy felt strongly that he was in some small way helping to save the cheetah with um, oh. the equipment. So. Um, yeah, no, well, you know, that'd be wonderful. I would be so happy if there was a zoologic preserve using them. That'd be Maybe amazing. there's a trip to Africa uh, in your future to go watch uh, cheetah, <laughs> cheetahs run. That'd be really cool. <laughs> yeah, we we'll could, take we you, Trina. Start installation and set up. I'll go. That was, that was the one. If, if that happens, we're taking you, Trina. <laughs> that was one of Tommy's dreams was to go to um, one of the preserves Aww. in Africa. Uh, really? We saw them Aww. run Franklin Park Zoo in Boston. All right, Trina's coming. <laughs> do you do you have any back orders from uh, Africa at present? Uh, yeah, several. I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, that's several. great. Because one has already gone to one of the really inferior competitors, unfortunately, which makes me afraid. But yeah. they'll, okay. they'll be back. It's okay. Now, with they'll all this, you have to have shipping equipment and shipping materials too, mm -hmm. don't you? Are you the shipping department as well, mm -hmm. Eddie? Oh, show okay. Eddie will show you. <laughs> Do you see that? It's a bunch of it's a the huge peanut bag dispenser. of peanuts. Perfect. <laughs> it's a peanut dispenser. And then you show the boxes. Oh, all the boxing. Oh, we have thousands oh, of boxes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, we're ready. So to look go. at all that. Like pan down, honey. <laughs> there, look at that. Woo. Perfect. All yeah. boxes. Yeah, you're ready to go. And then uh, we're ready to ship. And then you have to take them to where? Into Johnson City to the UPS store or? or... No, UPS. Yeah. No, up. we ship them oh, from very here. Good. Very yeah. good. All right. Well, folks, listen, thanks so much for, for joining us tonight. Trina, um, I know you're happy to see the, the tradition continue. I'm thanks for giving us the history. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and thanks for joining us. And keep up the good work and keep, uh, keep lure coursing alive. Hey. Well, thank yes. you again, Trina. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. That's great. And folks, we'll see you on the next episode of the Greyhound Nation.
Thanks so much for listening to the show. If you are not a regular listener, be sure to follow Greyhound Nation wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on social media, Facebook and Instagram. Just search for Grey Nation Show. Follow us and you'll get notifications every time we release a new episode. You can also get new show notifications when you subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you liked the episode, leave us a review on our Facebook page or your favorite podcast app. You can also send us feedback or questions via the contact form on our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. This episode was produced in collaboration with host John Parker. Our theme music was composed and performed by Dimitri Taras. Thanks to the past and present owners of Enjoy Lore Coursing for joining us for the show. Tina Bianchi, Eddie Komenik, and Selma Komenik. We also thank posthumously Tommy Bianchi for his invaluable contribution to one of our favorite Greyhound sports. If you want to learn more about Enjoy Lure Coursing products, visit their store at enjoylurecoursing.store. That's I-N-J-O-Y Lurecoursing dot S-T-O-R-E. I'm Michael Burns, and you've been listening to Greyhound Nation. <laughs>